Welcome to the France 24 debate. I'm Mark Owen. Thank you very much for joining us. Our program is dedicated to the people of Morocco in mourning right now for more than 2,500 people who were killed in the earthquake. We'll be examining what happened, why it proved so devastating, and looking at the efforts to rescue and recover and get aid to those in desperate need. The epicenter of the quake is near to the famous city of Marrakesh, and much of the worst areas affected are high in the Atlas mountain range. Therein lies a huge problem, negotiating rough terrain to get to places that were difficult to get to even before the earthquake struck. Let me introduce you to the people who will be discussing the issues uh, in this program. Maria Frasco is desk manager for the Middle East and Maghreb at, uh, and Asia at Secours Islamic France. Thank you very much for joining us here in the studio. Good evening. On the other side uh, of the uh, studio from Maria is Remy Bossu, seismologist, head of the Euro-Mediterranean Seismological Centre. Remy, thank you very much for joining us. We have two guests joining us from afar. By Skype from Geneva is Caroline Holt, uh, Director of Disasters, Climate and Crisis at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Caroline, thank you for joining us. And uh, joining us by Skype from Toulouse, Barbara Menka, who's Communications Officer for Pompier de l'Urgence Internationale. Barbara, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Before we speak with our guests, let's uh, get an update on what's been happening uh, this uh, Monday in Morocco. It's almost three days, of course, since the uh, quake struck. Uh, in a moment, we'll join our correspondent, Luke Schrager, who is in Marrakesh. Uh, first, here at France 24, Clemence Waller has this. In the village of Imiantala in the al Hawus province, a Spanish rescue team has been deployed to look for survivors. With their dogs, they search the rubble for signs of life. The remote mountain village has been destroyed by Friday's 6.8 magnitude earthquake and aid has been slow to reach the area. We're in the town of Imiantala. It's very remote and it took us about eight hours to get here. There were no rescue groups and we arrived with the police. The destruction is total. All the buildings have collapsed. We will begin our search using dogs and try to find survivors. For the hardest hit provinces, Al Hawuz and Tarudant, which are close to the epicenter of the quake, the devastation has been absolute. The two provinces are characterized by having a large number of mountain villages where help is more than difficult to reach. On Monday, a military helicopter dropped government relief items for people who were isolated in Igil. In Amizmiz, after burying their dead, the survivors continue to search for the living and begin to receive supplies from the National Civil Protection Service. With most shops damaged or closed, residents have struggled to find food and supplies. The army, mobilized to help the rescue effort, set up a camp with tents for the homeless who spent their third night outdoors. Meanwhile, Moroccans have mobilized to help doctors and the wounded. In localities and cities across the country, citizens organized blood drives to help refill the depleted blood banks. Among the donors were members of Morocco's national football team. Other volunteers organized food and essential goods to help quake victims after complaints that authorities were too slow to respond. It is an incredibly sad situation here at France 24. For instance, we have many people with links to Morocco, are from Morocco, from Marrakesh, journalists, security staff, people in the kitchen, all across the, the eight floors of our building, there are people who with links uh, to uh, Morocco. Many people very sad uh, this Monday. Let's go to Marrakesh. Our reporter, Luke Schrego, is there. Luke, give us a sense of what is happening where you are. Give us a sense of the scale of what we're facing. Well, it may have taken them a few days, but local authorities here in Marrakesh finally getting moving and uh, getting certain uh, means into effect. Where you see me now is uh, the city's first uh, shelter for those who have lost their homes uh, based in the Medina. Of course, the Medina, the World Heritage Site, world famous UNESCO area, the old city quite badly affected. These old buildings not able to stand up to uh, the, the force from uh, an earthquake of, uh, of such magnitude. People unable to remain at home with fissures going through the walls or in some cases having collapsed entirely. People telling us uh, almost universally that they have lost their homes, that they cannot return. They spent uh, uh, 
in some cases two maybe even three nights outside uh, with uh, with nowhere else to go now it has been the fact that uh, local authorities as I have said have been getting things moving now what I'm going to do now is uh, something we don't usually do on live crosses I'm going to step away from the camera and try and show you a little bit about the scale that of things uh, that have been happening here and you can see behind me you've got a lot of uh, mattresses being lined up this uh, this area was empty uh, when we arrived earlier people have been arriving all day they are brought in by buses they are they are told uh, that this area is available you can see that uh, people have been lining up mattresses uh, out of the sun it's quite a hot day about uh, 30 degrees today and it's in an old uh, it's in a sports center in the Medina itself outside just across this uh, astroturf football pitch you can see another one going into effect there. That's been going up since this afternoon. Uh, the organizers tell me that that should be uh, finished by about two o'clock in the morning. That will be where the men stay. You can see that construction going on there. If I rotate a little bit further, you can see uh, a lot of children, a lot of families, and the rest of the, the, uh, the, the sheer size of, uh, of what's happening in here, the, how many people are. By the time they get that second, uh, second shelter operational they'll, they'll have the room for about uh, two uh 750 people all told now they have been getting donations in from from local authorities the local commune has sent in a lot uh but what they can't tell me is just how long this is going to last uh no one really knows how long how long it's going to be before people can get back home uh, a lot of the people here they're all universally uh, relieved that they have somewhere to go they can come here there is medical uh, the set up there have been doctors from uh, uh, the red crescent and the local medical administration all here to take care of anyone in need there are there are, there is kitchens uh, being brought in huge more stacks of mattresses uh, plenty to eat they can wash and they can sleep and they can feel safe but what they need to know now is what's going to happen in the medium and the long term there is an enormous amount of work to do in terms of rendering buildings around marrakesh safe or even uh, deciding whether or not people can still live in them uh, what they're going to have to do is find out what's going to come next and uh, very few people have the answer these people have families young children around me that you can see uh, 40 municipalities have already seen uh, schools shut down and uh, there's this big question mark hanging over the future for all too many people here. Luke, you're giving us a real sense of how things are there in Marrakesh. I can imagine that where you are is going to really fill up very, very quickly uh, in the coming hours. Can you give us a sense of what is happening beyond the city? Uh, clearly, the, the effects of this quake have emanated far and beyond where you are. Indeed, uh, Marrakesh sits about uh, 72 kilometers uh, north of the epicenter. Now, it wasn't in the zone that was worse affected. We saw the report uh, from Clements uh, just before I came on air, uh, who gave us a, a good overview of, the, uh, of what was happening further to the south. Now, you've got to remember that this is an area around about the size of Switzerland. It is absolutely vast, very isolated and a very poor region, home to an awful lot of villages that are uh, deeply isolated and very, very hard to get to. There's not a lot of uh, transport infrastructure, not a lot of roads, and the ones that are have been blocked. What the army is now trying to do, what rescuers are trying to do, is get through to those areas and try to bring help in. Uh, they've got the, the king has ordered the air force to to begin to begin delivering uh, safety, uh, excuse me, supplies to those areas. That has been going on, but given the sheer scope of the operation that is going to need to happen there is an awful lot that remains to be done now again we've seen all of these offers of aid be pouring in from around the world to try and uh, to try and help and morocco has indeed accepted the help from spain uh, the united kingdom the united arab emirates but the, what the Interior Ministry has been saying is that uh, uh, they fear some sort of bottleneck in, uh, in terms of coordination. They don't want people to all arrive at the same time uh, and then end up sitting around because they haven't been able to be coordinated. Uh, State TV uh, has been saying more recently uh, during the day that uh, it's likely that Morocco will be accepting more aid moving forward, but that has yet to go forward as we, as we currently know now. Luke Schrager in Marrakesh. Thank you very much indeed. Please pass our warmest regards to everybody there. I know that's impossible for you to do, uh, but clearly if they could feel the 
the love coming from here, I hope that'll make them feel just a little bit better because what they're going through is an absolute hellish scenario. And thank you, sir, for reporting uh, the way you have with that detail and that professionalism. Thank you very much indeed. Luke Schrago, our reporter there in Marrakesh. Let's bring it into the studio to uh, start off our discussion here tonight. We've got Maria Frasco from uh, Secours Islamique France and uh, Rémi Bossou, who is uh, head of the Euro-Mediterranean Seismological Centre. And two guests join us from afar, Caroline Holt, who is from the uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, and Barbara Menka from Pompier de l'Urgence Internationale. Beginning with you, Maria, if that's OK with you. Um, this situation is its very difficult to actually sort of put into words, isn't it, the scale of what people are facing and what is happening. Um, what is your sense right now about what needs to be done? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So images speak louder than words, and we've seen a lot of images uh, from the field uh, uh, from the devastating effects of this uh, of this earthquake. So what is very important now in the first phase that uh, all the organizations that are based in Morocco are doing is the needs assessment. We have to go speak to these people to see what they need uh, and then uh, be able to plan our response, which uh, has to be uh, done in phases. So we need to have first the emergency response, the frontline response, uh, giving life-saving aid to these people and then as Luke was saying as well uh, the question of what is going to happen in medium and longer term. So from our side as Secure Islamic France uh, we have sent uh, teams uh, that are currently in uh, Tarudant uh, which is one of the of the areas that have been uh, worstly affected. Uh, they, are, uh, they are speaking to the people, they are going to assess uh, the needs uh, so that we can start uh, our emergency response as soon as possible as of Wednesday actually the first distributions. And I'm wondering about getting to people because one of the issues uh, as Luke was pointing out, the size of the area affected, as, as big as Switzerland, he was saying, mm -mm. the terrain is difficult. You know, we're talking about the Atlas Mountains, remote places that have been affected. Um, how can how can those with the best will in the world? How can the helpers? get to see all the people involved. It's a, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation, isn't mm. it? Definitely. And this is uh, why there should be coordination among the different organizations and local authorities. Of course, own organization cannot uh, support all the areas that were affected. So from our side, for example, we have uh, um, we have uh, established a, a log hub in Marrakesh, which is an area that we can operate, we can find supplies, uh, etc. And from there, we go to the most hard to reach areas. And we always work with uh, local partners, uh, local partners partners, Moroccan partners, they know the field well, they have all the acceptance from the people. So we try to, to, to coordinate as much as possible with them to have the most efficient delivery of aid. Uh, so we don't have duplications and uh, we, we reach uh, and we can go to the most hard to reach uh, areas. So needs assessment, very important. Uh, SIF teams are currently on the field, they're seeing what are the priorities, what, which are the areas that are the most uh, affected and uh, what we have seen so far is that that people are asking for water, so the the temperatures are very high. So what we do is that uh, our teams are visiting the villages, so they bring water with them. Every time they go to assess the needs, they take water with them to provide to the people. And uh, food is also what has been um, reported as uh, one of the priority needs, as well as uh, sanitation and hygiene. So we've seen that these types of situations can lead to risks of, uh, and we don't want to have another pandemic or epidemic. Uh, so it's very important to work on the hygiene, uh, on water and shelter. So you've seen everything is destroyed. So distribution of tents currently is what we are looking at uh, for uh, the families that have been. So affected. setting up that hub, as you described it, in Marrakesh and working from there. So exactly. I'm doula for that hub. It's obviously a very essential place to have. For now, Maria, thank you very much indeed. Don't hesitate to contribute if you want to say something sure. off the back of what someone else says. Uh, that goes for everybody in the debate, of course. Uh, Rami Bosu, can I bring you in to, first of all, call upon your, your seismological skills? Uh, why has this happened here? Why was it so big? Why was such a large area affected? Well, all the seismicity in the area is dri driven by the collision between the uh, African plate moving mo northward uh, and in colliding with the Eurasian plate. So the motion is typically a few millimeters a year, and it drives all the seismicity from Gibraltar down, uh, uh, to the east to uh, Turkey. So here it is clearly linked to this collision. So Morocco is not a high seismically active country. It is moderate seismicity. We still had an earthquake in the past, Al Husayma in 2004, which brings a lot of similarity with what we have observed here in the in the epicentral region. This earthquake is 
so strong, is very strong. The destruction of an earthquake is uh, depend of several parameters. First, the magnitude, because the magnitude controls the violence of the shaking which is generated. Mm. The second parameter is how many people are affected, how many buildings are affected, because basically it has the buildings which kill people, it has not the earthquake itself, and then the quality of the building. And in the in the epicentral area, because we have seen a lot on Friday, we're only seeing pictures of Marrakesh. Marrakesh destruction are localized in the Medina, uh, in the in some other area. But central, uh, the closest area is purely rural area, the first 40 kilometers where the shaking was the highest. Mm. And the quality of building is traditional building, so dry mud breaks, the dry stones, sorry, mud breaks, uh, dry stones, and they are very poor uh, they are highly vulnerable to the shaking. So, Remy, the problem that, say, occurred in the Turkey-North Syria earthquake, where on the Turkish side of things there was this whole row about uh, building regulations and whether uh, shortcuts have been made in terms of how buildings were constructed, that really doesn't apply to this, no. one, does it? We're talking about really old buildings, exactly. for instance, in the Medina in Marrakesh. Exactly. We're talking about poor people constructing exactly. with whatever they can get exactly. to build their houses. And this all makes it extremely vulnerable exactly. to any kind of earthquake. Exactly. That's a very different story because all the regulation applies to new buildings. It does not everywhere in the world. You do not yeah. apply them to past buildings. Look, for example, in Italy. You remember the L'Aquila earthquake? Mm -hmm. It was a historical city and it was destroyed simply because trying to strengthen this type of building is extremely, extremely expensive. You need to have individual studies per, per building and you risk losing all its value, its historical value by doing so. So here it's really a problem of the type of construction, uh, traditional construction in the countryside because basically and it is, um, it's a very sad, but it, it has very a lot of similarities with what we had observed in Alusayma. Alusayma in 2004, it was also during the night. Mm -hmm. And when you have a building in concrete, you can avoid so when the, uh, if the building collapses. So you may be safe in the void for days, but not if it is in the dry stones. Basically, everything collapsed. So the chance of finding survivors is, and, and we have seen pictures, people explaining that the wool village is destroyed. So that's absolutely terrific what's happening. But unfortunately, there is no, sing there is no simple solution for this. And again, I really insist it's, some, it's true everywhere. We had a small earthquake in France in June. It affected buildings which were from the 19th century, so old farm building, and exactly the same. The construction are very nice, that's nice building. Nobody wants to put them down because of the potential of earthquakes. But when there is an earthquake, they have not been uh, built to withstand this type of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of aggression, basically. You talked about Al Hasima just to the north. We saw it on the map as you were talking a, a little earlier. Uh, the situation, as you've described, it makes me feel very sad in my heart because. Yeah. The, the implication being that there may be few survivors underneath, which is an incredibly sad thing to consider. Remy, for now, thank you very much indeed. Remy, Bo Remy Bosu, seismologist. Let's bring in our, our other guest, Caroline Holt, uh, Director of Disasters, Climate and Crisis at the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies, joining us from Geneva. Uh, Caroline, we've heard from our guests in the studio the scale of what is happening uh, and, and their take on, on what is happening too. From your perspective, um, I mean, clearly, you have people on the ground. How are they coping? Do they have what they need to do their job well? Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the Moroccan Red Crescent, of course, is, our, is part of our network, part of our global network here at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. And therefore, we have been on the ground since the very, since the very first seconds of this. Um, we have been able to mobilize a uh, million dollars equivalent, let's say, to them uh, over the course of the weekend, and those teams are working immediately. But you're right, this is vast, and I think we can't underestimate it. The pictures speak for themselves in many ways, uh, and the level of devastation, the, the sheer scale and the sheer size, and let's not forget those places that we've not even managed to reach yet. The remote nature of some of those mountain villages means that the full extent of the needs is not even known at this time. Our teams on the ground are really uh, reinforcing the messages that we've already heard from your other guests, that the priorities, first and foremost, are to get people out from underneath the rubble. 
That search and rescue window we know will not stay open for much longer. Unfortunately, that's the nature of how it works. Uh, so we really are in a race against time here for the next day or two in order to reach people who may still be alive under the rubble. And then, of course, it's about taking care of those that have survived. And uh, as your previous guest said, uh, it's about water, it's about food, it's about shelter. But also our teams have been providing some basic first aid. I think your reporter also also referenced that the Moroccan Red Crescent are providing first aid on the ground and psychosocial support because the trauma associated with an event such as this really is uh, is immense. Not only do people live through the initial earthquake, but then, of course, with every single aftershock that happens and they are significant, they are forced to relive that trauma. So really supporting those families and those community members that have been impacted is one of the key priorities of the Moroccan Red Crescent. This is a massive task that your people on the ground have um, I'm wondering whether they can cope, whether they're, they're built to cope with this kind of thing, because at the end of the day, they're only human. The size of this, uh, this event uh, would have overwhelmed even the most well-prepared of systems. Uh, I think that we need to be very conscious of that, that this would stretch most uh, countries uh, in Europe in terms of the size of what's happened here. Therefore, uh, one agency cannot do this alone. The Moroccan government, of course, are coordinating national actors. They've also now opened up and reached out to international partners to a certain extent to come in and really support with that search and rescue. But this will be a case of coordinating a number of actors on the ground and also uh, really accessing and reaching out for that support as required. But understanding what the needs are is a complicated matter, not least because of access, but also the sheer size and scale. We can see now the, the, uh, the numbers of people that are actually seeking support with the pictures here uh, and trying to coordinate agencies uh, who are best placed to provide the right sort of aid to the people at the right time is a really critical job and one that the Moroccan government will now be, uh, be prioritising. For now, Caroline, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for sharing all that with us. And we'll get back to you uh, very, very shortly. Do stay uh, with us because uh, next up is uh, Barbara Menka, who's uh, live from Toulouse, communications officer for Pompier uh, de l'Urgence Internationale. I'll try to translate that as uh, fireman of international urgence. Does that work for you, Barbara, as a translation? You're nodding, which is nice. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Barbara, I can't hear you yet, but let's give you a chance to talk and see whether our sound crews have sorted it things out whilst right. I'm talking. I can hear you now. That's brilliant. Uh, okay. Barbara, give, give us your take on the situation. You've heard what everybody's been saying. Please just take up take up the narrative where you are. All right, sure. Well, thank you for all the uh, for all the input. I've heard actually very interesting uh, uh, comments. Uh, uh, we are actually not uh, in Morocco at present, so I'm actually not able to contribute insider information. But for the one we have received from one of our members, who's actually there because he happened to be visiting his family, so he's French and Moroccan, and he was there when this happened. And of course, he's been giving us, uh, you know, well, uh, insight as to how bad this really is. And and uh, even though this is, of course, a recurring scenario for us, uh, because we deploy very often, far too often, uh, of course, um, well, you know, every disaster is different. So, um, of course, Morocco, it, uh, well, it's very close to home for us. Uh, as you know, uh, French people love to travel to Morocco. This is a lovely place and, uh, and um, we always feel at home there. And uh, to be here and not be able to help is, of course, uh, slightly frustrating. And at the same time, we understand. I mean, like Caroline Holt mentioned, uh, we don't know the full extent of the need. Uh, they're still assessing the situation. Uh, they don't need a rescue team flowing in from just about everywhere. I I mean, this has to be organized and this has to fit in within their own relief efforts. So and of course, we we, you know, abide by their decision uh, not to ask for any more international aid at present. What can you offer, Barbara? Give us a sense of what your organization does. 
Well, initially, we would have probably deployed as a youth art team, which is an urban search and rescue team, uh, basically to search and, you know, search and rescue in the rubble, uh, basically using our uh, equipment, also using our search, do search dogs, uh, like we did in Turkey a few months ago, six, seven months ago. Uh, well, that would have been probably the first thing we would have done if we deploy uh, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours after the disaster. Uh, now, at this stage, perhaps the needs are different. I'm actually pretty sure they are. I think what is true in the morning may not necessarily be true in the evening because they are assessing their needs and also because the situation changes based on the uh, based on the relief. So now what we could offer would still be medical help. We also have an emergency medical team. We could also help uh, with uh, drinking water because we're able to produce drinking waters. So basically, you know, we can adapt to the needs of the population, whatever they are. So we have offered our uh, assistance to the uh, Moroccan authorities and, uh, well, you know, if needs be, uh, they will let us know and we will intervene, but only then. Barbara, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to raise a question for all four of you, uh, and this is probably the only issue to, to, to be worthy of, of the title debate, I suppose. Uh, Morocco refusing, it seems, or saying it doesn't quite need yet any help from France. Uh, and I'm wondering whether that is something that is going to change or perhaps should change, and maybe more international help should be coming in. Barbara, as you were saying, things are needed that you, as your organisation, could provide, but you, obviously you don't have the green light to go there yet. Uh, Barbara, do you think, coming back to you, Barbara, just having left you, uh, Barbara, in Toulouse. Do you think uh, that perhaps Morocco should think again about how, it, who it allows in to help? So far, just Spain, Qatar, Britain, and the UAE. Well, I mean, for sure, it is not, you know, uh, down to us uh, to tell them what assistance they require. And uh, they know best, I mean, what the situation is, what their needs are, and how they can also accommodate all those teams uh, coming in. Uh, like I said, every disaster is very different. Here we have access issues. So perhaps they're thinking too many teams will only make the situation harder, which is quite understandable. Let's uh, listen to the words of the uh, Foreign Minister of France, uh, Catherine Colonna, on this uh, very issue. This is a misplaced controversy. Morocco is a sovereign state, and it's up to them to decide what their needs are. A misplaced controversy. Maria Frasco, would you, would you agree with that statement? Uh, you know, as I say, it's not even worthy of calling it a debate. I think if Morocco says stop, we can't actually welcome all everybody's aid all in one go. Mm -hmm. It is something that the world has to respect. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, I will agree also with what Barbara was saying. Uh, it's their choice to make uh, from our side. Uh, we try to help uh, as we can. For example, as I was mentioning before, we we support local partners. So local partners that are already there, that they already, already have their areas of intervention doing the assessments. So from our side, we do. Uh, we have to abide, of course, with what the government said, with what the local authorities say. So through local, local partners for now, and uh, if uh, then uh, uh, the French aid is accepted in the following days, we will be happy to step uh, to step up our interventions and uh, send more teams and uh, more aid to Morocco as per their needs. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a frustration among you all, uh, and with the greater respect to King Mohammed VI, who appears to be a much-loved leader uh, among Moroccan people. Um, I wonder if it's a sense of frustration that you, you hear there are people who haven't had help. You hear there are people who are sleeping rough. You hear there are people who need food, water, accommodation, shelter, people who need to, 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 to be helped, a hand to help them, but you can't go. That must be incredibly frustrating. I mean, for now, we do what we can. We, we continue our needs assessment. We go to the people to see what they need. Uh, we support our local partners. And again, this will enable us to be ready. Uh, if uh, one day uh, Morocco accepts uh, the French aid, uh, we will be ready to go uh, without uh, any hesitations or without any further uh, delays. Uh, we sense the willingness uh, coming from the uh, Sukur Islamic France. Uh, Maria, thank you very much indeed. Can I go back to Geneva and speak with Caroline Holt? Uh, Caroline, I, I, I know you've been able to listen to, to, to what I was saying about the, the fact that perhaps Morocco should change its, its position. What do you feel about that? I feel that, as the others have said, we need to respect the work of the uh, government of Morocco, who are coordinating in an extremely difficult situation. 
chaos and confusion rules right now uh, in any disaster, but certainly one of this size and certainly with an earthquake. So I can quite understand that it takes some time to understand where those needs are and where those gaps are. One thing I would say is that if uh, if, if the people of France want to uh, support, then the French Red Cross actually has already launched an appeal uh, whereby it is providing then support to, as I say, the uh, Moroccan Red Crescent, who's uh, uh, also a member of our network. So there are ways and means of supporting those local actors that are already already very busy on the ground, and I would uh, I would urge people to uh, to reach out in that way if they feel so inclined. Maria, you have a, a, something to add. Yeah, uh, we're following the same model as Caroline was mentioning. So we have also launched uh, an appeal uh, for uh, for support. And uh, we are very happy to see that uh, all our partners and donors are already considerably mobilized uh, uh, to help. So uh, yeah, this is a way to support uh, on our website. There, are all, there is all the information uh, going through the support with local partners for now, but also preparing our teams if one day they will be able to go on the field uh, as if. Indeed, and it sounds from, from what I'm hearing that people on the field is what is required. Uh, Remy, that field, uh, and you've described to us the scale of what has happened and why it's happened, but that area, the geography, the whole setup, getting to and from was already very difficult before this happened, wasn't it? Exactly. We are in a mountainous uh, region, yeah, and the first, uh, when you have uh, uh, earthquakes shaking mountains, you have landslides, is typically. So basically, it was all the recipe for a disaster. Uh, it was the uh, in close epicentral distances, so where the shaking is the highest. You had vulnerable buildings. You have the. Uh, uh, it's not main cities. It's a lot of uh, villages, uh, so spread uh, habitats, uh, and and difficulty to reach it. So that's absolutely a disaster. And today the difficulty is with aftershocks. There is also people are. It's very difficult because. Immediately after the earthquake, so like one hour, less than one hour after the main shock, we had the first significant earthquake, which uh, aftershocks, which was like 4.8, if I remember correctly, and it adds to the trauma of the people. It, it's really it's, it's something that we often underestimate. It is the psychological cost of all this, even for the people who have not suffered directly in their in their body. With the, uh, it's really something which is difficult to cope with because it it never stops, and people are extremely. Uh, it's extremely difficult for them to to cope with this. Regardless of the help they can get, uh, being shaken, it's always a reminder. It's always something which is very difficult. And this is something that will live with generations in, in Morocco. No. It's, it's not something that ends when no. the house has been rebuilt. When, exactly. When and the, the aftershocks are going to continue for weeks and months. So they are rate... For weeks and months yes, aftershocks. Yes, because the, so their rate decreases with time as an average. So basically, we have already seen that they are not as intense, the, the number, the rate is decreasing. We may still have a strong aftershocks next week or in two weeks' time. There is, you know, nothing against it. After a few months, it will be much smaller. But before it goes back to background seismicity, it can take, yeah, weeks and months, weeks to months. So this is a difficult period for the, uh, for the people. And there is always the, to, uh, the difficulty to find the balance be between Rebuilding as fast as possible. The, month, the winter is not far away, uh, but you don't want you, you. We should at least take this opportunity to build better. Uh, an earthquake basically is not only. What I was saying that uh, you know the buildings were in dry stones, mud bricks, etc. It's not the type of, of uh, it's not the type of construction which is. It's really the way you build them, and. An earthquake basically finds the fragility. It's like it's really if there is one thing which was not properly done, it will collapse. So it is really, and it's always, it is always very challenging to, to find the right balance between providing shelter rapidly for the population and building in a way that uh, the same catastrophe will not happen again. There's often temporary buildings that are put up as a temporary solution turn into a permanent thing no, no. and don't get replaced. This is a problem that you see in countries after war, for instance. No. Even Great Britain after war, no. prefab houses were put up as homes for heroes. They came back and they actually were meant to be temporary. They lasted for like 40 years, that kind of thing. You know, Some of them are still standing. The thing is, how can poor people build back better? That's the question. Well, really. th if they have no skills, they cannot do it. But they don't have m money to buy the resources. It's not they? always the money. Of course, you, you need money to build, but the extra cost of building it to survive, this kind of shaking is not enormous, but you need the skills. 
and this is difficult if uh, if the uh, you know if the local people don't have the skills it's very difficult because of course you want to get a shelter before the winter you want to you need a shelter many people need medical supplies we've heard that uh, i think resonating from all our guests uh, one of the issues is blood of course and uh, the Moroccan football team were meant to play Liberia on Saturday because of the earthquake. That game was called off, a qualifying game for the uh, Africa Cup of Nations. Uh, some of the footballers uh, of the uh, Moroccan team have been giving blood and uh, they've been actually telling uh, our cameras uh, why uh, they felt it was necessary. Let's uh, see if we can hear uh, from a couple of those Moroccan players. As national team players, we must set an example and do what is necessary to help our country, which is currently suffering. First of all, our thoughts are with all those who have died. Today is a day of national mourning. And the latest coming in, rescuers digging uh, through the rubble after the earthquake. Uh, a warning, and echoing what Remy's just been saying, traditional mud, brick, stone and rough wood housing omnipresent in the high Atlas Mountains is reducing the chances of finding survivors, which is, it makes your heart sink when you, you read that kind uh, of wording. Uh, let's bring in uh, Caroline uh, from uh, Geneva, from the uh, International Federation of the Red Cross, Red Crescent. Uh, in terms of giving blood, we saw the footballers doing their bit. It, it's really important that people uh, give blood. It's really important that people help in any way they can, isn't it? It's really important and it's very human as well, isn't it, to want to help in this situation. So uh, I think that the, there's a great job that's being done right now by the medical uh, agencies or the medical infrastructure on the ground in terms of blood. It's very common that blood is absolutely required at a time like this, but also many other things will be required, not only today, but in the uh, in the immediate and the medium term going forward. Everything to do with first aid, but we saw also from your report there's, there'll be a need for, for bandages, for, for simple medications, um, also, then, we, also, we need to remember that it's not just about the earthquake um, injuries, let's say. There will be a need for people who have uh, diabetes, people who have uh, heart issues. A lot of, well, everything will have been lost when their house collapsed, maybe, and they might not have access to really critical medications. So that will also be on the mind of the government, no doubt, and the medical uh, services on the ground in terms of just really supporting people with those ongoing medical needs. Because, like you say, there are so many things that perhaps we don't think of in those circumstances. Ongoing problems which, of course, now are all the more complicated to treat because the actual treatment or the, the, the delivery of that treatment has been completely broken by what has happened all around. Uh, Caroline, thank you. Barbara Menka from Pompier de l'Urgence Internationale joining us live from Toulouse. Uh, Barbara, in terms of... Uh, what needs to be done? I mean, clearly, there is the medical side, there is the rescue side. What, what do you see now as, as, as the most important thing to do over the next, say, 24 hours? Well, it would be really for the people who are there to tell us what their, what their most important needs are. Uh, probably medical supplies, you mentioned that. Drinking water, we found uh, that drinking water is always, of course, essential. So we would be able to produce that uh, if we came to Morocco, but probably other relief efforts are able to provide that as well. So we, we really need to listen, listen to what the needs are based on how they get reassessed and when. And based on that, uh, of course, we will be happy to provide that help or other organizations will uh, to be you know more efficient um, it's really up to them to tell them to tell us uh, what they need right now Barbara Benka thank you very much indeed bear with us I'll try and get back to you before the end of the program uh, Maria Frasco of uh, Middle East Maghreb Asia at Secours Islamique France you wanted to add something yeah I wanted to of course it's very important to know what should be done in the next 24 hours in the next days uh, it's life-saving assistance we're saving people's lives but we should also ask our question what will happen next year in Morocco what will happen in the mean term and the longer term there are pe the people that uh, that have been affected are already asking this question and they cannot find any answer so we should have a plan uh, psychosocial support is very important and it's very uh, uh, often overlooked uh, in these types of situations. So the children will need to go to school again one day. Uh, the people that will be living in tents for some some uh, some months, they have to have their houses rebuilt. Otherwise, they will live in tents for years and years, as we have seen in other types of crisis. So yes, emergency response, very important, life-saving aid to the people. But we should also ask ourselves... For because for all of the families that we saw 
saw at the beginning of the program when we had we were with our reporter Luke Schrager, who was in the tent in in Marrakesh. All of those families need to try and re-establish some kind of routine, don't they, of of family life, of educational life, of of of, of meals, of 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 getting fed and watered. All those kind of things need to be re-established. Definitely. And uh, I will tell you that for now, for sure, most of these people that have lost their homes, they will live in tents for quite some time. But we should not forget them. They will stay in tents. They should not stay in tents for, for years and years, as we saw happening in other cases. We should have a reconstruction plan, work together, all the NGOs, together with the local authorities, to be able to give a durable solution to these people so they don't live in tents depending on humanitarian aid to survive. Indeed. Catherine Colonna's words that, you know, it's, it does, that it's, it's a false debate about uh, Morocco not accepting French aid straight away. Uh, but a um, question for all four of the guests be before we, we wrap up the program. Um, do you get a sense that the reconstruction of Morocco, which, which has to happen sooner rather than later, Maria pointing out that, you know, you can't have children being brought up in tents in the, the 21st century. It's just not acceptable, is it? Um, this reconstruction, it really needs a major international effort, doesn't it? Can I get a thought on that from you, please, Caroline? Caroline in Geneva. Yes, thank you. Um, I, learning from uh, previous uh, experience, of course, of which fortunately or unfortunately we have a lot, then uh, long-term recovery and development and the re-establishment of these cities and these communities, it's not a quick task. It will take a long time. We're definitely in this for the long haul. And I can only imagine that uh, the Moroccan government will reach out to those trusted partners and ask for additional support. Indeed. I'm not going to go down the geopolitical line and say whether France is one of those or not. We'll wait and see what happens. It's all documented, the problems between the two countries. Caroline, thank you. But what isn't documented and what perhaps is common sense is that if you're going to build something, you need to build it on solid foundations. Back to Remy, our seismologist. If the earth moves, how would you start to build on that? We haven't got a lot of time for this I think it would be a long answer, but if you could be as brief no, as possible. Well, we know how to build and to... You characterize basically the expected level of shaking, and we have the means, we have the techniques to build buildings which uh, which uh, which survived this type of shaking. And basically the highest the shaking... So the, the technology is there. Technology is there. The solutions are there. We are not in Japan. It's not... Well, this one it was very strong, but... Uh, the majority of cases, the, the, the shaking will be much milder. Look at what happened in Marrakesh. It's the Medina. It's not the recent buildings as a majority. So basically, we have the techniques. The techniques exist. Here, clearly, it shows all the historical buildings, all the problems with historical buildings. In Turkey, as you mentioned before, it shows with some of the new buildings the difficulty to apply these rules because there is a lot of money uh, involved. And, and then if there is no control, you discovered that they were not properly applied when the earthquake happens. But the technology is there. So it's a question, really, of, of the, the right kind of build, the right kind of materials, uh, uh, and the right kind of techniques. Uh, techniques and the right type of control. We, it has to be controlled. Because you can make any plans. If you don't look at what is being done when you rebuild the building, you, it disappears. If there is still missing, if there is not the right quality of concrete, then it's done. I hear what you're saying. So... <laughs> And again, I'm not, I'm not being disparaging about anybody in Morocco. Will this need an international input, do you think? I, I don't know. This is really, it's okay. not, I, I don't know. I mean, I had to, I've got to ask the question. Yeah, because, yeah for sure. You know, obviously, I think people watching this will want to know, can any new structures put up in this zone survive again? I mean, there may not be another quake for another 100 years. But it's going to happen again. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah. And with the way everything's changing with our climate, with the way the world is changing, clearly that's a possibility. Remy, thank you very much indeed. Remy Bossu, seismologist, head of the Euro-Mediterranean Seismological Centre. Thank you to Caroline Holt in Geneva from the uh, International Federation of uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent Society. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Barbara Menka from Pompier de l'Urgence Internationale. Barbara, thank you. And uh, I'm hoping that your team will be sent there uh, soon because it sounds to me from what you said, they've got much to contribute. And thank you to Maria Frasco uh, of Secours. Islamic France. Maria, thank you. Thank you for telling us about what your organization is doing already on the ground with their partners uh, in uh, Morocco. Thanks to you for watching. Do stay with us. We'll bring you more, of course, on the situation in Morocco uh, in our news bulletins. And uh, thank you for joining us here on the France 24 debate.